Welcome to the Turning Point Show, where we pull back the curtain on high-performance individuals. Here's your host, Andrew O'Malley. Welcome to the first ever episode of the Turning Point Show podcast. I'm your host, Andrew O'Malley. Delighted to have Brian Keane on the first ever episode. Brian was actually one of the people who gave me a kickstart to get this up and running in the first place. I was probably waiting for the perfect time to get started, and he advised me just to dive into the deep end. So here we are today. In the beginning, I was probably a bit nervous. You know, I didn't want us to be speaking for 45 minutes. I need to find out that the recording messed up. So thankfully, everything on that front went smoothly. And the conversation really flowed from start to finish. We cover a lot of great topics, such as find your passion in life, how to deal with negative people and haters who are holding you back. And then other topics, such as how to deal with cravings and much, much more. So I know personally, I got a lot of value out of the episode and I'm sure you will also. So without me rambling on for any longer, let's get right into the first episode with Brian Keane. The guest on today's show is Brian Keane, an Irish fitness entrepreneur who's the owner of a successful personal training business. His top 50 online program, GA Lean Body Program, are extremely popular in Ireland and across the world. It's amazing how much content he pumps out on a daily basis, whether it's through Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, where if... If you ever seen his Snapchat Q and A's on a daily basis, he answers literally any any question you may have. So definitely check him out there, Brian K zero one nine. As well as that, he also has one of the most popular podcasts in Ireland at the moment, the Brian King Fitness Podcast. So it's another area where you should check him out. Definitely, Brian's actually one of the people who helped uh, give me a kick up the arse to get this podcast started. So delighted to have him here today uh, on the show. So thanks for coming on the show, Brian. Hey, thanks for having me. So yeah, as I said, great to have you here. So if you want to give people a, just a bit of an introduction, kind of uh, how you got started in fitness and kind of your journey along the way up until the present moment in time. Uh, okay, so my background, uh, I'm from Galway in the west of Ireland. I grew up in Connemara, like in the middle of nowhere, little town of probably 200 people. Um, my kind of fitness journey started, I started training pretty young. You know, I joined, joined the gym at 16, um, lifting weights since I was 13. My main kind of story was... I was a personal trainer. I was a uh, primary school teacher. That was my background. Um, and I literally loved fitness so much and decided that I want to make this change. I, I loved teaching. I worked in London as a primary school teacher for four years. Um, and it was great. And I enjoyed it. And, and I loved working with the kids. But it wasn't my why. It wasn't the thing that got me out of bed every morning. I would sit and talk for hours about training and nutrition and fitness, even when I was working in in school, to the point that people were like, just shut up talking about it, you know. And so I decided that I was going to go down the route of personal training. So I went and did my first fitness course, effectively ran, did two jobs for about two years where I worked full time as a personal trainer. Um, And then I was trying to do my side hustle, which I call it, where I try to set up my personal training business um, on the side. I blew so much money trying to do it first. I tried to, I made a couple of attempts at making the switch over and be going full time personal trainer. And then I lost all my money. I had to go back teaching, I had to do it part time. Um, and then I just side hustled until I got to the point that I was able to move home, set up my business here. And now I've got, you know, a very successful, quote unquote, success is a subjective to each person, but in my eyes, a successful business that serves, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. Um, and a social media following where I can help as many people as I can. Um, and basically now I work, as you said, my online top 50 program is my main muscle building fat loss program where I work one-to-one with people within a group on online. And I've got my GA Lean Body program was where I work with um, GA athletes who want to combine basically uh, the, the look of a fitness model or a cover model or get the physique they want but make their performance better on the pitch. So basically look like a pro, perform like a pro. Um, and that's kind of led me to where I am now. Yeah, I suppose, uh, especially with the GA Lean Body Program, there wasn't anything really out there in the market uh, that was similar to that. I know uh, from personal experience from friends who've tried the program, they found it great. I suppose, yeah, you filled a nice uh, niche in the market there. It was, yeah, it, it's uh, it's my background as well. It was one of those that generally you create your own look and look is preparation meeting opportunity, but I got lucky with my GA Lean Body Program. Like I played for 20 years. I've been all Ireland medal at my club. Um, and then I switched and took a two-year break and went into competitive fitness model and bodybuilding. And I won a pro card, finished eighth at the Worlds in Las Vegas. Like I, I did did okay in that side of the industry. And then I basically was like, I'm going to merge these two training systems and try and get and do a program that you can look the way you want to look but perform better. I ruined myself at 19, 20 when I started training first 
I was doing bodybuilding movements and I was doing all these basic bodybuilding lifts and it was ruining my football performance. And it basically created the program for like the 19 year old me who wanted to look a certain way and perform better. So, uh, so yeah, so I got lucky with that one. I, I love that program myself. It's what I'm doing at the minute, actually, during my preseason. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I suppose you'll be back, back into the hard train and the hard slog now the next, next few days. So, yeah. Same as myself. So, you obviously, you enjoy teaching, as you said. Obviously, what you do today is still a different form of teaching. Maybe it's not a teaching a skill, but obviously, you're, you're educating people with all your content, your programs. But say, what what are your views on, like, say, the education system? It doesn't have to be in Ireland, but just in general. Or if I said to you, you could do anything, say, three things with the education system, what would they be? What would you implement? Um, what I, the number, well, if I was to go three, definitely the number one thing for me is to realize that I came through the traditional education system. I, I, I got a degree. I have a business degree. Um, I did the primary, did the secondary, went to college, got a degree, did a postgraduate, became a teacher, and started teaching. Um, there are people and kids that aren't going to respond to the traditional system. And there are certain ways that people will, will, will frame that, that, well, if you're not good at reading and writing, you're not smart, you're not intelligent. Um, and we tend to have this in the educational system here even that well if you can read and write and do math you're smart you know where you've got kids that will be able to put stuff together with their hands that are just gifted at you know construction or woodwork or whatever it is but they, they're there's dyslexic and can't read and our system at the minute tends to be very aimed towards um the people that are good at literacy and numeracy and and that's something that i struggle with because i I wasn't very good in school until I went to college and then I kind of started to shine in that area because I had an opinion on everything. That opinion got you, got you in trouble as a teenager, which actually serves me well now. Like it helps in my, even my business now because I, I have an opinion on everything. So I tried that section, but um, I think that there needs to be, uh, is, there, is your question based on the, nutri- on the educational system? Yeah, just in general, like uh, for example, there, there's not a big focus on say health and fitness. Like it doesn't have to be just health and fitness, you know, that'd be one big aspect, obviously, this day and age. Like, there's so much obesity in kids, and kids don't even know how to kick a football now, like, in school, or, like, catch a frisbee or whatever it may be. They're all, they can do anything on a computer, but when it comes to, like, kind of, like, just normal physical fitness, they can't can't do anything. So maybe, like, that'd be one thing, or it doesn't it'd be very general. Like, it doesn't have to be three, three obviously, reasons. It's, it's what, well, this is probably why my kids loved me so much, because I was, I took, I, we never missed PE. <laughs> like, <laughs> Best PE. teacher ever, yeah. <laughs> It was it was funny. I had because um, I used to teach fifth class was my main class, like fifth grade, and uh, they, we, we they were, you were scheduled for two PE sessions a week, and you they were optional, so you could do something else if you wanted. But my kids never missed it. Like we literally did PE every single week. Cause I'm like I love PE. I was like we're dropping whatever else, and we're gonna go to our PE. But, and, and it's the, the the health side of it as well. Like there's a lot of particularly because I was working in inner city London as well, and and people in towns and cities you they don't have a lot of farmland i had farmland so i could run around outside and um, a lot of the kids didn't have that there's parks and stuff but they, to be able to do their at least their two hours a week in school of pe at least got them out doing physical stuff and then when you did science and nutrition it made sense in the context that you're able to be like look if you want to be better at football or better at basketball or better at lacrosse or whatever it is the sport you were doing i was like these foods are going to give you more energy they're going to make you feel better and they're going to and that lands with a lot of guys particularly um like boys are girls tend to be a lot better at that age group in terms of just retaining information guys mm-hmm. I, I was there i had AD, the worst adhd <laughs> like you know but that lands with guys we were like look if you eat these foods you're going to have more energy and you could potentially you know, play a higher level in your soccer or your football or whatever. And that tends to land with them. And um, that being said, that was something I did apply and I put a lot of focus on when I was teaching. Um, but I know it's something that's not in the educational system. I largely brought that in. Um, like I, used to have, I, I actually ended up doing, I remember one PE class, I had my kids do my circuit class because I, I was doing a part-time personal trainer at the time um, and I was trying to get my business off the ground. And I literally had my kids come in and we did the full circuit class like I brought in my cards and everything that had all the exercise. They loved it. They were like, they were talking about that like six months later. They were like, Mr. King, can we go back and do the class circuit thing again? Jeez, that'll be, like, that'll be your clients next now. That'll be I've the... <laughs> been seeding it for 10 years down the line. That's it. <laughs> yeah, so oh, that's that a great answer. Yeah, I know it's definitely, uh, I know just myself as well when I was growing up on the scale that it was, 
you know, it was very important that kind of getting outside and playing where he's now kind of was probably the last generation where you go out there and you spend all day and all night outside and come back in, have a bit of food and where he's now like you never see anyone out playing. But uh, oh, that was a great answer. So I'll just moving on to the future a bit now. So obviously it's been a roller coaster a few years now since you're teaching and now you've got a successful personal training business. But what does the future hold for Brian Keane? Like maybe say 10 years down the line, do you have a vision of where you want to be? Or are you doing what you're doing now, or is that... Uh, I, probably to the detriment of my own mental health at times, I know exactly where I'm going to be in 10 years. Um, I'm very much... Um, one of the things that has supported me so much in my own journey has been my actual ability to envision and viscerally taste where I want to be and what I want in my future to the point that it's caused some pretty bad anxiety and worry. And I, I have a whole section of my book that's coming out in the early summer on that. And a lot of my social media feedback on people that have supported them was because I, I dealt with that and had to that issue with anxiety and worry and because I'm constantly living in the future. I'm constantly like, right, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? Which serves you and makes you quote unquote successful, subjective to each person. But it means I'm constantly striving for the next thing. And I can tell you where I'm going to be in 10 years. Um, but to give you an idea, because without going through my entire list of what I'm going to have. Oh yeah. No, no need to give any exact specifics. Anyway. <laughs> but the, the, the idea would be, I love what I'm doing now. Like I've said before on different podcasts, different videos that I would do what I, if I won the lotto tomorrow, I would still do everything I'm doing now. I'd be here talking to you. I'd be making Facebook videos. I'd be on Snapchat doing Q and A's. I'd be making my podcast. I'd probably scale it up. Like if I won the lotto tomorrow, because I love what I do, like my job and my, my life are one and the same and they're, they're interlinked together. Um, and I love it. So what I'm going to be doing is going to be a scaled up version of where I'm at. Like, I'm fortunate enough that I get people sending in questions for Snapchat. I'm on Facebook and doing Facebook Live and Instagram Lives, and I'm able to support and serve as many people as possible. I want to scale that up and 10x that and 20x that and 100x that at a scale that is going to be mind-blowing to me even now. But there was a time when I, three, four years ago, I was still working as a primary school teacher in London where I didn't realize that I had have, you know, 50,000 followers on Facebook, 50,000 on Instagram, you know, uh, best podcast and the, the high, highest ranking podcast in Ireland. All of these things would have been really unrealistic, which is, which is your own self-created limitation, would have been unrealistic at the time. So now I set my bar and I never let my own limitations of thought ever cap where I want to go. So my goal is to literally serve and help. The reason I pump out more, like I pump out a lot of content, like anyone that's listening to this probably follows me or knows who I am. And like I pump out a lot of content. Um, I love what I do. Like that's not work to me you know, um, and it's because I'm able to help as many people as possible. Like I've always said, like, and I've said it on Snapchats that I, owe, the, the way I live my life is I want the world to be better because I was here and I want it to be the same for my daughter. That's literally my entire life goal is I want the world to be better because I was here and she was here. And every, everything I do reflects that and the, the amount of content I put out and it's reciprocity you know I make a good living and I've got a good successful business because it's reciprocity I put out that and it comes back to me you know and, and and currency is effectively just the universe's way of saying how much value you're providing so I, I it comes back to me but in terms of where I'll be in 10 years it's going to be this just at scale it's going to be the the 10x 100x versions of this like i'll have a uh, hundred thousand million followers on fucking snapbook or whatever the fuck <laughs> thing is you know and, and that's the plan and, and try and help as many people as i can along that journey that's a great point there so as, if you're doing it on a regular basis what you enjoy doing it's not going to feel like work you're going to be happy i know you use the term non-job a lot of the time which means that while you're putting in long hours you know it doesn't feel like work so you get a lot of reward out of it. What would you say to someone who's thinking about making a change in their life? They might be at a bit of a crossroads when it comes to work or personally. Do you have any advice for these types of people or what they should do? Yeah, I would. And I did a podcast recently, actually, uh, very, very similar to this on how to build a life around what you love. Um, and basically how I decide, because people, I actually had a conversation with a guy I'm working with in, in London and he was asking me something very similar. And he's very well off. The guy is doing very well for himself. Um, but he, he hates what he does. And he's like, how do you find your why? He's like, how do you find what you love to do? And I was like, okay. I was like, what, what, would, you, what would you do for free? So we had that conversation. 
I was like, what do you get up in the morning thinking about? Like, what do you go to bed at night dreaming about? I was like, it's that. Like, you know, I know myself that I went down the fitness route in this whole area and uh, the fitness, nutrition, mindset, all of that side is because that's what I went to bed dreaming about. That's what I spent my mornings thinking about. That was the information I consumed, the videos that I watched, the books that I read, the magazines that I covered. All of these things were based around that. Like Gary Vaynerchuk has a great quote that, the person that's been cooking in their kitchen with their grandmother since the age of four is always going to be better than the chef who went to college for four years. And that's how I feel about fitness. I'm like, people are like, oh, what you say this about fitness? I'm like, man, I've been training since I'm fucking 13. Like, you know, I was like, I've been reading most of the... I was like, I've got a stack probably twice my height from every magazine on fitness there was from the age of 16 to 26 because that was where my interest was. So I knew myself, that's where my area was. So... Anybody that wants to make that switch, what's that? what does that look like for you? That may not be fitness. That may not be nutrition. It may be fucking flowers. Like, you know, you may love daffodils, roses, and, you know, tulips. Like, if that's what you love and that's what you consume all of your thought thinking about, you can build a life around that. You know, that this is one thing that I've learned, and I've been very fortunate that I've been allowed to travel the world, and I work with people all over the world, and some of my mentors are based in different countries, and it gives me different perspectives that I've learned. You can make a living doing anything if you're good enough at it. You know, cream mm-hmm. always rises to the, cr- to the top, and if you love, like, there are people that will literally get paid to eat chocolate and fucking sample I'd be like, yeah, this one's good. This one needs more milk. Like, see that that's a job? Or you get people that are, like, covered, covering, you know, um, basketball. Like, I, I was watching a YouTube video yesterday about a guy who literally does 1986 to 1989 rap. And he, that's his blog. And he monetized that blog through affiliate marketing and different things. And because that's when he was in high school. And that's where his, that's where what he loves to do. And he made his life around that. All you have to do is find the tools and the people and the books and the programs that support how to do that. All you need then is the blueprint because if you have the blueprint, you can do it. You know, it's finding out what's the thing that you go to bed dreaming about, what you wake up thinking about, what do you spend all your spare time. When I was in a teaching room talking about fitness and people were like, shut up, Brian. I'm like, oh, I should probably do this fitness thing. Like that's where that where you find it and once you know that and you've made the decision that this is what i love to do i love movies or i love music or i love ga or i love basketball or i love flowers or i love cars you find a way to build your life about that all you do then is just get the blueprint from somebody else that's done it and be like okay you know how how do i do it what do i do now you know that would be my advice i suppose that's a large aspect of it a lot of people they know what their passions are they know what they enjoy doing, but they might be a bit afraid of taking that next step. When you're doing your side hustle and transitioning from teaching to going full time with the fitness business, where there are a lot of people doubting you, saying, oh, what are you doing, Brian? Quitting teaching, which is a steady, safe job, and transitioning to self-employment, which may be risky. Uh, was there many people doubting you and asking you why you were doing it? With the exception of my mum, fucking everybody. Like I had, I had like my mum has my mum's been my greatest fan, and my mum's literally like, if you're happy cleaning the street and you have a roof over your head, go clean the street, you know. And that's she's been still that at me since the age of twelve. Um, I went off that path because you had you know people that were powerful in your life, you know, my dad, my uncles, aunties, people like that are like, well, go this route. This is the safe route. This is the steady route. Go and do that. And, and when I left it, because I went through the system and I was a teacher and it, teaching is seen and perceived as a good job, you know, nice holidays, good pay, pension, all the steady stuff. And when I left, I was literally called everything from an idiot to a fool. Like, and, and people were more, didn't shun me, but I felt like if you were in fucking medieval England, you would have been shunned, like, for, for leaving it, because that was the reaction I felt from people. Um, and you're going to have that, because that's what people are like. You have to understand, or this is what has supported me, and I'll only offer my perspective, is... I love Stoic philosophy. When Mark Zuini says a quote that he says, everything in life we see is a perspective, everything we hear is an opinion. And that's how that is. Everything that was offered to me at the time was a perspective. That, there were people that, that wanted the best for me. That was family and friends that were like, oh, you're stupid to make that jump. You're leaving a good job to do something that's probably not going to work. You know, the, that was their perspective of that moment in time. That was their opinion on that moment in time. Opinions change. Perspectives change. Like, I talked about in a section of the book about opinions and perspectives. We once thought the fucking world was flat. 
Like, that when we knew the world was flat, you know, until Aristotle came out and was like, well, the circumference of it says that it's probably round. And we were like, okay, no, it's not. And now we're like, well, we know the world is round. Because what happened? More information was available, the perspective changed, the opinion changed, and now everyone's like, well, of course the world is round. How do people think it was flat? That was stupid. You know, a hindsight bias where they look back and be like, fucking Egypt, what do they think? And that's what... Everything is like that. When you're trying to make a, cut a trailblaze a new path, of course people are going to view it from their perspective and have their opinions. These same people that told me that I couldn't do it or shouldn't do it or was stupid to do it are the same people who are like, I knew you'd make it. I'm like, you didn't though. I was like, you didn't. They were, that's not what you said to me three years ago, you know? And that's fine because it's just the opinion and perspective and hindsight bias kicking in that people are like, oh, well, I knew you'd make it. I was like, you didn't though. You know, you really, really didn't. You know, I had to fight against what you said. You know, but and you, you know, it just and be aware that'll happen because the fear sets in. The only difference between the people that are doing what they love and doing what they want and the people that aren't is they the people that are doing what they love haven't let the fear stop them. That's the only difference because the fear is there for everybody. The only difference between me now, and I'll use myself because you're your own best example. The only difference between the me of now and the me of four years ago is I feel the fucking fear now like everybody else. I just don't let it stop me. You know, that's, and that's, and just be aware you're going to have that. Regardless of what that looks like for you, you're going to have that doubt. You're going to have that fear. Everybody has it. You just can't let it stop you. You can't let it paralyze you into not making the decisions that are going to support the end goal. Like one of the big things that people fall into is they kind of go the safe route. Like you're talking about a handy job, but I always find when you're, especially when you're young, kind of, well, young's relative, like, but. Yeah. say you're coming out of college or out of school that's the time you don't have many commitments like you don't have kids or you don't have uh kind of like a family to look after most of the time or like these types of things that they're the times when you you need to just go for it and kind of just forget everyone else and just give it a good go and see see how it goes and where it takes you because inevitably if as you said earlier like if you if you love enough you'll you'll be successful at it yeah one of the big areas that you're you talk a lot about is investing in yourself so whether that's kind of going to seminars or listening to books, reading books, taking courses. So what what's the importance in your mind of investing in yourself? I think it's probably, if you were to handpick the single most important thing you can do, it's to invest in yourself and double down on yourself. Um, the major difference between the me of now and the me of, say, four or five years ago is now I invest in myself. It's funny because we have a very, I was a very different person four or five years ago. You know, I spent my money on stupid shit, you know, like I was buying clothes and I was doing all this because I wanted to fit in and have people like me and all this stuff that now is uh, relative at the time with how I felt, where now I invest my money in books, seminar courses. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong and that everyone has to do this. I'm just explaining what has worked for me. Because when you invest in you, you're, the, the, the truth is you only get, you're only going to get one life. You know, you get to decide what direction that life goes in. And by feeding your mind with positive things and that, and that things that support that end goal, you're going to move towards that. Like, and I've done this, you know, I've sat and watched and monged out to TV for two, three hours every single night, and that's fine. And if you're using that as a deload time, that's fine, you know. But the reality is fucking four hours of Kardashians probably isn't going to help you get onto the, the journey or the path that you want. But in a book that is surrounding yourself with information about biographies of people that have done it, you know, or marketing books for a business or nutrition books for your diet if you're trying to lose weight or whatever that looks like for you. They're the things that are going to support you. That's investing in you. You know, how that looks then is going to be relative to, you know, your bank account. Like there was a time I literally had, there was a time when I had no money and had to fucking go through my couch to get money for the bus. And I could barely afford an audio book, you know, but you invest in yourself and you build an, on that. Now I'm fortunate enough that I was going to seminars and now I get to work with people like, you know, I'm working with Tony Robbins in, in June and Jack Canfield and these people that are really successful in their areas because it moves up. You scale up as, as things move on and you get quote unquote more successful or start climbing the ladder against your right wall, you can start investing in you in different ways. But for me, it's audiobooks. Like I read two, three books a week. You know, yes. audio, I listen to, like I read one book a week, you know, but I listen to two books because I'm always, if you see me with headphones in, I'm listening to an audiobook or I'm listening to a podcast, you know, or I'm listening to something that's feeding my mind or fueling my mind with something that's going to support the end goal. My end goal is to reach more people and help them as much as I can. So I feed my mind with things with biomechanics, nutrition, physiology, mindset, because that supports me 
and it supports people that follow me and I can help them. So that supports the end goal of building off and serving more people. Find what your end goal is. What does that look like for you? That may be completely different for you. You may want to want run you know, a bar or a flower shop or your own mechanics or get out of your job or be the best mom you can be or be the best dad you can be or be a family person. Whatever that looks like for you, but invest in you and support and feed your mind with things that are going to support that end goal and don't watch fucking four hours of the Kardashians every night. It's not going to help. <laughs> yeah, great answer yeah so it's funny because recently i kind of noticed uh i used to watch a good bit of, like whatever netflix and there was only recently that i kind of thought to myself oh, it was about three or four months as i watch a tv show because when you're so engrossed in what what you're doing kind of that you're enjoying what you're doing you don't have to like you it doesn't matter how many hours in a day you work at that you just enjoy it so much that you kind of you don't know as the time going by and you don't you don't have time to to kind of watch these shows or whatever but one aspect I'd like to touch on with you is you kind of briefly mentioned there in your question about you used to be maybe three or four years ago keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing. Uh, how, what, what do you do now? Like say, obviously if you put yourself out there in social media, there'd be a lot of sometimes backlash for certain things you say. How do you deal with that and kind of not care what people think or say about you? Uh, that's a good one because I literally, I, I have a full section in my book as well. <laughs> I don't know how I care what people think because I suffered from that more than anything. A lot of my anxiety and my worry and these issues that I had came from keeping up with the Joneses and comparing myself against others because this is where you get a little bit of an issue with fitness because when you're scrolling through Instagram and Facebook and seeing, you know, big, massive, jacked up dudes, you're like, you're never going to be big enough. You're never going to be ripped enough. You're never going to look the way you want. Nobody ever is if you're comparing yourself against others, but you can be better than you were yesterday, better than you were a month ago. And that's when you're using that as your bear. That's when you move forward. But I I struggled so much with, com- I love the quote, comparison is the thief of joy. I had that printed on my wall for nearly two years because it's something I had to tattoo onto my brain because I constantly did it. And it's something, we all do it. It's automatic. Like, it's something that we all do. We compare ourselves to other people. We compare ourselves to how we look. We compare ourselves to how much we earn. We compare ourselves to, you know, our ability in sport or whatever it is. And we all do that. And you're comparison against someone else is always going to make you miserable, first and foremost, before we get into how I deal with the hate. You comparing yourself against you, and it's the... See, this fucking you versus you quote has been ruined by, like, you know, topless selfie models and and, and glued-ass girls putting up you versus you on on an Instagram post. So it's ruined that. But the truth is, it's you versus you. Run your own race, because when you're not looking behind you, you're focused on your journey. To be honest, some of the way I deal with hate is I don't even know what's coming. Like, unless it's blatantly, like, smashed onto my Facebook wall. Um, like, I, I've literally sat in rooms and people are like, oh, so-and-so hates you. I'm like, I don't even know their name. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know who that is, you know? And it's not from, and I'm not, that's not coming from a place of ego. That's coming from a place of, I'm so focused on doing my thing and putting out my content and running my business and being a better dad for my daughter and doing these things for me and serving as many people as I can. I'm not paying attention. And sometimes I miss the hate that's going around. So, you know, it, but that happens when you get so focused. And I love the, I love the, uh, the, the description for focus, follow on one course until success. Like when you're so focused on something, you tend to miss a lot of the hate that's going on around you. You know, I've literally had people go, oh, so-and-so slashed you on Snapchat. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what they're first. I don't know who that is. Where are they? Where they're, they're in Dublin or wherever. Like, and that's, and that's, and I, as I said, it's not coming from a place of ego, but just be aware when you find the thing that you love to do more than anything else in this world, you tend to lose a lot of the white noise. I also have a very, very close first network of people, people that I, when, as soon as I, someone says first network or inner circle, I'm like four people that spring to mind and their opinion matters. Like when I do, and I get them to call me on my stuff their opinion matters. If they tell me, look, Brian, you're, I, I don't think this is a good idea, or I don't think that's a bad idea, or I dislike the way you handle this situation, their word matters. Largely outside of that circle, everything is white noise. And that's good, bad, and indifferent. You know, it's the same reason that I largely, and thankfully, have, when people will say that I've met me that have, you know, that I was friends with years ago, they're like, oh, you're still the same person. They're like, you're different. They're like, there's a drive in you, but you're, you're different, but you're the same person. Largely because I don't let all the positive stuff in. I take it and I'm like, oh, cool. I'm so happy I could help. But I don't internalize that. Their thoughts and opinions and perspectives of that moment in time. So is the hate. The hate is a thought, opinion, and perspective of that moment in time. They're they're aimed in my direction. They're not my thoughts. I'm not taking any 
um, attachment to those thoughts. They're not my thoughts. They're other people's thoughts and opinions and perspectives of that moment in time. Who am I to take that on board? Like, good, bad, and indifferent. So it allows me to continue to do my thing. Also, what I found myself, as I do a lot of work on myself, I personally don't hate anybody now. I don't hate on people because there was a time in my life when I did, and that was a reflection of what was going on in me. And I was projecting my own hate onto somebody else. And when I realized that, when I was able to have a bit of self-reflection, a bit of self-awareness of when I would think back to a time when I'm like, oh, I hate that guy, or, you know, you want to write a nasty comment on social media, I'm like, that was a projection of me onto them. I was like, that said more about me. So every time it comes to me now when somebody's like, oh, a horrible comment on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, I'm like, oh, that's their stuff. Like, that's a projection of them and the way they feel onto me. I'm like, I'm just literally the thing you're bouncing off, you know? And that's, and that's how I deal with this. You know, I, I put that full section in the book on how to cope with that and strategies for it. But that's kind of like the idea because it, it's what supported me. It's what's allowed me to stop keeping up with the Joneses because now I don't care. Like, you know, it, it just, it doesn't bother me. Like, I'm literally, you know, my friends joke, my inner joke that I'll be a multimillionaire in 10 years and I'll still be wearing an Amex t-shirt and a gas <laughs> trousers. Like, you know, because I got it because I like the way it sits, you know, it fits. You know, and it's true. I don't, I don't push, I don't put anything into those anymore. Because it was a time when I did, when I put everything on who I was in, to what car I drove and what clothes I had and what body I had. More importantly, where now I'm not attached to any of those things, and it's led for me to be happier. It's something I do with people I work with. I'm like, look, you do you. You know, don't worry about what other people are doing or saying. I'm like, go do your thing. Because if you found your path and your ladder's against the right wall and you're climbing that ladder, you're going to be happy regardless. Oh, that's, that's a great answer. Yeah, no, I say a lot of people take take a lot out of that because I know it's something a lot of people struggle with. So I'm just conscious of time. I know you're busy. So uh, I'll move on to a few quick fire questions. So right. just a few general ones. So you're obviously a voracious reader, like you're saying, or you listen to audiobooks. So if you had, say, a handful, maybe two or three books that you recommend the most, whether it can be any topic, whether it's fitness, philosophy, uh, business, finance, whatever it may be, uh, what would they be? Uh, my favorite books, now I'd always answer this question depending on the topic, but my actual favorite books are Robert Greene's Mastery. is my favorite book of all time. Um, I love Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within. And I love Jack Canfield's The 20 Success Principles. They're probably my three of my favorites. All right. So, yeah, no, they're all, I've, I've actually read the Tony Robbins one there recently and I got, got a lot out of it. It's kind of a big mindset shift when you when you read it. So, just a couple of just general fitness questions. So, what, what would be the most common training mistakes, maybe two or three that you'd see people make, whether it's in the gym or just kind of from dealing with clients? Uh, lifting too heavy without getting form right. Like, I have so much focus on my online program on doing correct form, working for tension. Purely, the reason I work for tension is because regardless of whether you're trying to lose fat or build muscle, that's going to be nutrition-based. You're going to get more out of your training by working for tension, putting your mind into the muscle and training the muscle you're trying to work. I've literally seen guys go in, guys particularly, guys are a little bit worse than girls on this, is go in and start throwing up weight, you know, because they're yeah. two kilos ahead or heavier than their mate did like and not work any fiber not work the muscle under tension and that's fine it's different if you're a power lifter or a strength athlete there's there, there's difference but if you're training for look and body composition or performance for sport you got to work for the program and work for tension on the muscle the biggest mistake i see is people not lifting too heavy because heavy is relative but lifting with poor form and not working the muscle you're trying to work you know as i said in my online program is mainly based on tension style training because if you're in a calorie surplus and eating enough calories to support growth, you're going to build more muscle. If you're trying to lose body fat, you're going to increase your metabolism by tearing more fibers training that way, so you're going to lose more body fat. So whether you're a guy trying to look like a fitness model or a girl trying to drop four dress sizes, that style of training is going to support you as long as your nutrition's in you know in conjunction with that. <laughs> and uh, what would be say the most common nutrition related mistake you'd see people make? Um, it, it really depends. Probably um, not spacing meals. This is a personal one for me because I base my program off keeping blood sugars balanced. 
um, and keep it primarily because you get such a massive increase in energy because your body starts to use those calories for current energy and doesn't store them towards fat. So when you have a higher energy output, you feel better, you have more energy through the day, and you can have a, tra a higher training output because your blood sugar is stable and your energy is cleaner. Um, that's probably the biggest mistake I see is people either skipping break breakfast and then blood sugar is dropping and overeating at lunch or later on in the day. Um, or eating foods that are going to not help with your cravings, things like your processed foods, certain polyalcohols and things like some protein bars and stuff like that can be really bad for cravings. This is probably the main thing that I see people is, is, is that is not spacing out their meals or eating foods that are going to give them cravings and then wonder why they have cravings. It's probably the biggest thing that I see. Okay. You, yesterday, I think you put out a bit of content regarding cravings. Just quickly, what, what couple of tips would you give people who are dealing with cravings whether they have like a bad sweet tooth or something like that uh number one thing the first thing i do in my program in the nutritional plan is eliminate any foods that can cause cravings so i eliminate preservatives flavorings processed ingredients polyalcohols things like that that are notorious um diet drinks that can mimic insulin in the brain and, and, and make a mess of your cravings things that are going to cause cravings the first thing i do is cut those things but for people that just have a sweet tooth and assuming that everything's right i use organic stevia um be careful that you're not buying like tesco or dunn stevia because that's like five percent stevia and maltodextrin or some other cheap ingredient because stevia is a thousand times sweeter than sugar so they don't need to use a lot in it but if you get the hundred percent organic stevia you need like two or three drops of that it's a thousand times sweeter than sugar and it balances out your blood sugars so that works incredibly well for me that and 85 percent dark chocolate um i love that stuff that tends to and i've got a sweet tooth like i i may as well have born a, a 14 year old girl like i have a bad chocolate cravings but those things have, have, have helped me loads yeah sounds like myself as well i've actually got yeah 85 percent bar sitting beside me here i'll be talking into shortly <laughs> so just a couple more quick questions uh so it say there's three people alive or dead you'd like to have dinner with who would they be uh, it doesn't have it doesn't have to be three people a couple of people uh arnold schwarzenegger definitely um <laughs> I, from my, from my own bodybuilding background and fitness background and someone that has literally when you hear his story and moved to the u.s without english mm. and rose to the governor of california and probably the only reason he didn't become president was because he's not a, a, a u.s national so arnold schwarzenegger is there um after that, probably, I can't think of anyone else after that. They put the other spot here, yeah. <laughs> if, 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 there's people, Napoleon Hill, um, who wrote Think and Grow Rich, um, and probably Dale Carnegie, who wrote uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, purely because Dale Carnegie worked with some of the world's greatest minds, you know, Henry Ford, he interviewed these people. I think what I'd be able to pick up from them would be incredible. I think Dale Carnegie and Napoleon Hill are both dead now. Um, and and Arnold Schwarzenegger is still alive as, as, as this goes out. Um, so hopefully, I do plan to hopefully meet him someday. But uh, that would probably be my dinner my dinner date. And I have no women there, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's more about me, I think, does it? <laughs> uh, definitely, yeah. Good answer there. So what are three, two or three vital habits that you'd say recommend people to implement kind of on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, first thing for me is getting your nutrition on point because you keep your energy up. So my main habit is regardless of where I am in the world, I eat meals every three hours or I'll snack every three hours to keep my blood sugar stable and keep my energy levels up. One of the reasons I'm able to pump out more content and, and do some, and I do it like I've got a, my, my little girl is two in May. You know, I've got a little girl at home. Um, I pump out probably more content than, than anybody. I run a business and I train, I do all my things. Keeping my nutrition on point and keeping my blood sugar stable is key for that. It allows me to keep my energy up all through the day. Um, so that's habit number one. And, and that's regardless of where I am in the world. And I travel a lot. I'll always keep that every three hours to make sure that my energy level stays stable. Um, and then next then is uh, using audiobooks in the morning or using something that fuels my mind and puts me into that good proactive state first thing in the morning uh, every single morning i do my i have a recovery strategy in my g80 body program which is like my fast release trigger point training dynamic static stretches i do that every single morning while i listen to an audiobook um, and that has served me more than anything else because it sets me up in a very proactive and creative state for the rest of the day and generally when i get the morning right the rest of the day tends to fall in place for me all right so just a uh, second last question here now are there any common attributes that you've noticed from being around successful people or, or observing them over the years that kind of 
you'd see in all of them some common attributes? Uh, yes, the main thing I see is amongst successful people, they learn to get shit done regardless of whether they want to do it or not. Um, and that's that. That's the fitness people, business people, um, people that are successful in relationships. Is they do the things that they need to do regardless of whether they want to do them or not. Um, that's something that I picked up from some of my own mentors that I worked with. That there's there's mornings and they'll tell me they're like, there's days I don't want to do these calls, or days I don't want to do this um, email or whatever it is, and they just do it anyways. That's something that I see as a common trend across the way. Um, and the other is that every single successful person that I have personally met that I consider successful subjectively has some form of training exercise or meditation routine. Um, and now I know myself, training gives me a second wind. It's one of the reasons that I'm able to get as much of my work done that when I hit my lull, like I get up in the morning at half five or six every morning and I hit a lull every day around 12 um, yeah. and I train at that time and it gives me a second wind for the evening always you know and it's always done that for me and it's always made me feel better and every successful person that i've met has some form of meditation training exercise that gives them a second wind and allows them to get a second wind of energy you know during the day and they're probably the two things that i've seen the most yeah that's great yeah no especially i I think in recent years meditation's become a big uh thing that people are doing on a maybe to some people it sounds a bit woo woo or kind of training is a meditation i think meditation is, is anytime you're switched off from the world for me training is a meditation like i my my two hours or my hour in the gym two hours but like i take a while to shower like my hour in the gym like i'm normally in, like my session's done in 50 minutes um but that's 50 minutes that i've disconnected from the world i've got music in um, and, and it's the only time i'm not listening to an audiobook or a podcast i've got music in when i train and I'm training, my, I'm disconnected. That for me is meditation because you're disconnected from your normal thoughts. Um, so it doesn't need to be the woo woo, it doesn't need to be that, even though it's trending now. Um, I think anything that disconnects you from the world temporarily, which is what training and exercise does, but when you're doing your last rep on squats or, you know, uh, a minute on a burpee or whatever it is, your heart's going through the roof, you're not thinking about, you know, your worries in day to day life. So that's, that's, that's what supported me anyway. Yeah, that's actually a really great, great answer there. Uh, I know you're extremely busy, so I'm going to let you get going now. Just one last parting question. Do you have any advice or last thoughts you would like to leave listeners with before you go? Um, I'll leave you with the advice that I think I'd offer my younger self. Is, and this is, this is one I've talked about before on a lot of my channels. Is People are always going to tell you you can't do something, but you can't let other people's vision of you become your own reality. You've got to go and do your thing. And realize that it's your vision. It's not anybody else's. It's not their job to fall in alignment with what you want to do. You just got to be stronger. And if you're waiting for permission, you're never going to get it. Or if you are waiting for permission, I'm giving giving it to you now. Go do whatever it is that you need to do. Do the thing that you love. And don't let anybody tell you you can't because you're going to get that. Everybody that is going to strive for what they want most is going to have haters, naysayers, and people telling them they can't do it. You need to rise above that if you're going to achieve it that's a really powerful way to end the podcast right there so i know you're extremely busy especially today so one last thing before you go where exactly is the best place for people to find more about you and what you do uh best place for me is definitely snapchat um brian k019 on snapchat is my most active platform at the minute it's, it's because it's the one where i can interact back and forth with people directly i love that um and my podcast the brian key fitness podcast uh, it's the number one health podcast in ireland at the minute um and my facebook instagram youtube's all brian Keen fitness and my website for anyone that wants information on my online program or my ga lean body program or just to sign up to my newsletter www.briankeenfitness.com is where you'll get me on, and, and on any of those platforms that's great thanks again for coming on brian no bother thanks for listening to episode one of the turning point show podcast with brian Keen. I know I got a lot of value out of that episode and hopefully you did also. If you got some value out of the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave a five-star rating on iTunes for the podcast. You know, it's a great way of just getting the word out a bit more. So that'd be greatly appreciated. If you wish to find out more about the resources mentioned on the show, we'll have a show notes section on andyomali.com. It's also contained links to various social media platforms you can find Brian on as well as myself. If you had any feedback on how the podcast went, any issues you had or any advice on how we make it better advice for guests to have on etc 
you know, we'd, I'd really appreciate hearing them, you know, whether you send it on a private message or whatever it may be, you know, it's as the first episode, things obviously aren't going to be perfect and it's about getting, get into a rhythm of things and eventually we'll get to a point in time where, you know, we're really happy with the production side of things and we'll look to continue to improve the quality of the interview, flow of the interview, types of questions asked, etc. So, you know, we have some really exciting guests lined up in the coming weeks, so make sure to watch out on my social media platforms as well as maybe subscribing on iTunes to the podcast so you don't miss out on any of these great episodes that are coming up. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate all the support. Take care and we'll catch you next week for the next episode of the Turning Point Show podcast.